So Yeshua says, because your hearts were hard, that's why Moshe allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. He says, and I say to you, verse 9, and I say to you that whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. You're, you're, you're putting the wife of your youth away, and she hasn't done anything sexually immoral. That's adultery. Why? Is because you're putting her in a jam. You're putting her in a situation where she's going to have to remarry in order to take care of herself and her children. Or, and e even if she doesn't remarry, you're still, you're putting her in a jam. You're breaking your marital covenant vow. That's adultery. You're breaking your vow. I don't know how much clearer I can say that. You're breaking your vow. So, Whoever divorces his wife, except for the cause of sexual immorality, and then you, worse, and then you married someone else. You should have stayed married to her. But now you've married someone else. You're committing adultery. He says, and whoever marries her is divorced. Whoever, he who, who marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Because she's still married. So you're, you're causing a marital covenant vow to get separate. You're, you're breaking a vow. Whether you're breaking your own vow or your new wife, you're causing her to break a vow. You're breaking a vow. Not cool. That's not good. You shouldn't do that. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10, he says, this is Shaul. He says, now to the married I command, yet not I, but Yahweh. What he's saying here is he's saying, this is what scripture, he's, he's explaining what the Torah really says to us. He's interpreting the Torah for us. It's a good midrash. He says, yet not I, but Yahweh. He says, a wife is not to depart from her husband. Okay, so you write her certificate of divorce, send her out, she should turn right around and come back and go, honey, I'm so sorry, please take me back. I'm, I didn't understand, you're my head, I acknowledge your headship, everything is headship in the kingdom. I, I'm so, I repent. Please take me back. A wife is not to depart from her husband. Yet even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. She's married. She's made a vow. Live your vow. That's what he's saying. Live your vow. And then it says, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. There's, there's no qualifiers there. Shaul, is, he's talking about Hosea's perfect example. And not that Hosea was perfect, but his example in that was perfect. A husband is not to divorce his wife, period. There's no reason to divorce your wife. When you come under the blood, we're no longer to regard anyone after the flesh. We're supposed to remain in the calling in which we're called. If your wife leaves you, then you become a more spiritual person. Now, uh, then Shell goes on to say that if you do remarry under those circumstances, you know, if you, if you can't be alone, then it's better to marry than to burn. But the point is we're supposed to be spiritual creatures now. We're supposed to be spiritual creatures. How many of us are getting that? So again, the principles. Whatever happened before salvation is past, let each one remain in the calling in which he's called. But when you take a vow unto Yahweh Elohim, it stands. And that doesn't if you, if you took that vow before you came into Torah, after you came into Torah, during the time you were coming into Torah, it doesn't matter. When you come under the blood, when you make a vow to Yahweh, keep your vow. That's the point. Love your wives. That's the point. The goal here is to create stable families and to be good to all men and women, especially in the body. We are the body of Yeshua. It's just, we're, we're literally, we're different cells in the body, you and I. And whatever, whatever part of the body you want to think that we're an individual cell, whether we want to be a part of the little finger, or the, the face, or whatever you want to do. I mean, I mean we, our job is to get, just like the cells in the body, there has to be blood exchange, there has to be oxygen exchange, there has to be fluid exchange, there has to be metabolic exchange. The different parts of the body help each other. And we'll talk more about that again in the study on the fivefold and the Great Commission. But we have to work together. And right now we're not in the year 2012. We, and we, we need to begin working together. We need to begin doing so. We need to begin giving an example that honors Yeshua. 
So the goal is to create stable families and to be good to everyone. Now, congregational leaders especially are examples. You need congregational leaders, leaders and teachers especially, we have to keep our vows. Whatever comes from our mouth, we have to do what we vowed. We have to be good examples to the flock. If we divorce our wives, that's not being a good example. To be a good example to the flock, we have to love our wives no matter what happens. Now, I want to just shift gears here just a little bit. We're going to talk about Acts chapter 15. We're going to talk about apostolic accountability. We're going to talk about how we are to establish Yahweh's order and Yahweh's purity in the assemblies. This is a related subject here. Now, just briefly, we'll talk about this in some other place. Before Acts chapter 10, before Acts 10, the gospel or the good news was being preached to Jews only. But then in Acts chapter 10, Cornelius got saved, him and his family. And then by Acts 11, all sorts of people were getting saved in the assembly in Antioch, lots of Hellenistic Jews. Well, then by the time you reach Acts chapter 15, there was a dispute over the entry requirements. And we're going to see how this ties in later. So in Acts chapter 10 and verse 44, let's, let's take a look at this because it's an interesting interplay. It's going to talk a lot about where do we go from here? We, basically, what do we do now? So we, we've seen what Yahweh's standard is, that, we're sub- that men have to keep their vows and men have to hold each other accountable. And we need to have both transparency and accountability to all the other members of the body. There isn't a cell in your body that doesn't have to be accountable to all the other cells. So... Acts chapter 10 and verse 44. It says, While Kepha or Peter was still speaking these words, he's speaking to Cornelius' house, the set-apart spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. Verse 45. And those of the circumcision who believed, interesting phrase, those of the circumcision who believed, now we're talking about one house Messianic Jews, such as you might find in the UCMJ, the MJAA, or the UMJC. And if you were to go to the land of Israel, I met several people, they, they called themselves, you know, Pharisees who believed. Basically, the, a couple people come to mind, I'm not going to mention their names, but they said, you know, says to me, I guess I would call myself a Pharisee who, that believes on Yeshua. That's the kind of person we're talking about. They're into the Talmud, they're into the man-made traditions and rituals, but they believe on Yeshua. I don't understand how they reconcile all that, but we'll talk about that at another time. So it says, And those of the circumcision who believed, we're talking about one house Messianic Jews, were astonished, as many as came with Kepha, because the gift of the set-apart spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify Elohim. They're like, how does this happen? These guys are Gentiles. How are they speaking according to the set-apart spirit? That's, That's impossible. They're Gentiles. They can't do that. That's only for Jews. Well, then Keith answered and said, can anyone forbid water? I mean, yeah, I know it's kind of unusual here. We're not really sure why this is going on, but can anyone forbid water? I mean, is there some reason we shouldn't immerse them? Because they've received the set-apart spirit just as we have. Okay, well, that's Acts chapter 10. By the time we get to Acts chapter 15, and we'll do, we'll do a deeper study on this in the fivefold ministry study. Acts 15 and verse 1, it says, and certain men came down from Judea and taught the... I believe these are the same men we saw before. This is the sect of Pharisees who believe. These are basically Orthodox Jews who believe in Yeshua as the Messiah. These are the UCMJ, the MJAA, and the UMJC type. They, they, they're Jews, they're Talmudic, but they believe on Yeshua as the Messiah. Okay. So certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren. Now check the language here, it's very important. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moshe, not the Torah of Moshe, but unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moshe, you cannot be saved. Now, what we're talking about here is what's called the Giur process or the Gentile conversion process. Okay. So this is a, this is a process. We, we have to remember that the New Covenant wasn't written in a vacuum. So... We're talking about this, this is the, the rabbis that had a Gentile conversion process for the longest time, and it's this long drawn, like today, and the Jews are very traditional, so what they do today is very similar to what they did in the Middle Ages, very similar to what they did in the first century. And the process as it is today is you have to take classes in rabbinic interpretation of the Torah, what, what the rabbis call Torah law, 
but you have to take classes in the rabbi's understanding of how things are supposed to go for about a year. Then you have to pass exams on how the rabbis say things are supposed to go. And then once you've passed your exams, then you can be physically circumcised. And then after you're physically circumcised, then you are saved because they believe the acts of your hands save you. So that's how that goes. So obviously this isn't going to sit too good with Shaul and Barnabas or Barnabas. So it says, therefore, when Shaul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, if you can visualize what that's saying, they determined that Shaul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the elders and apostles about this question. We'll talk more about that phrase in the fivefold ministry study. The thing I want you to see right here at this moment is they didn't just make their own decision. They went up to Jerusalem to the elders and apostles. So there'd be one decision for the entire body. We're talking about apostolic accountability. Key phrase. You're keep that thought in mind. Verse 5. And it says, But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed. Once again, we're talking about the UCMJ, the UMJC, and the MJAA. They rose up. We're talking about David Hargis. They rose up saying, talking about you, David, it says, it's necessary to circumcise them and, so, and then to command them to keep the Torah of Moses or Moshe. So and it, it's interesting because this is the order in which things happen during the Gure process. First, you teach them your rabbinic interpretation. Then you test them on your rabbinic interpretation. Then once you've tested them to prove that they know how you interpret the Torah, then you can allow them to be physically circumcised, and then you believe that they're saved by the works of their hands. Okay, very interesting. Acts chapter 15 and verse 6, it says, Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. We'll talk more about that in the fivefold study, but once again, all the apostles came together, so there'd be one ruling and one right ruling for all of Israel. Apostolic accountability. Acts 15 and verse 7, when there'd been much dispute, there would be dispute. If you got the UMJC, the MJAA, the UCMJ, and they all got together in a room with me, and then we got the MIA, and we got everyone associated in the Messianic world, got us all together in one room, as should happen here, so there can be one right ruling for all who believe to have true apostolic accountability, you'd get a lot of dispute. So it said, and, and praise Yahweh, I hope that we will have this someday coming soon. And it said, and when there had been much dispute, Kepha, or Peter, rose up and said to them, said, men and brethren, you know, you know this thing, okay, you know that a good while ago, Elohim chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the good news and believe. So what he's saying is, he's saying, you know, listen up. I mean, you, you know Yahweh chose me for this thing, so listen to what I've got to say. Okay? This is not me boasting on me. I'm just pointing out the simple facts. This is what Yahweh's telling us. Okay? He's saying, so Elohim, who knows the heart, he knew their hearts. He knew their hearts were right with him, or he wouldn't have given them the Spirit. So he's Elohim, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the set-apart Spirit, just as he did to us and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Why there do you test Elohim by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples? He's talking about the Talmud. He's talking about the Giur process. He's talking about the rabbinic interpretation of the law. Why do you test them? They, they didn't know anything about the Giur process. They, they weren't keeping the Giur process. Why do you test them by putting a yoke called the Giur process on the neck of these disciples, which neither we nor our fathers were able to bear. You know, why are you putting the Talmud on these guys? Why are you putting salvation by the works of your hands on, the, on these guys? That, that's not how it is. We don't know if they're circumcised or not circumcised. They're Hellenistic Jews. They might very well be not circumcised at this point. But Yahweh gave them the Spirit just as we did. Yeah, they'll have to get circumcised now. But they didn't take any gear process. They didn't, they didn't go through a year's worth of classes. So verse 13, it says, And after they'd become silent, so Kepha, I guess, made his point. And then Yaakov answered, saying, Men and brethren, you know, let's all calm down. You know, listen to me. Okay. Verse 19, Acts 15, verse 19, says, Therefore I judge 
that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to Elohim by making them keep this giur process, by making them keep the traditions and teachings of men, by making them keep the Talmud, by making them keep man-made teachings and traditions that Yahweh didn't put in place. So what are we doing trying to put them in place? Haven't we read Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2 where it says, do not add to my word? Solomon says, do not add to his word lest you be, lest he, you be found a liar. He says, therefore I judge we should not trouble. Let's not add anything to Yahweh's word. Let's not add anything. This is Yahweh. He, he, he gave them the set-apart spirit. So don't trouble the Gentiles who were turning to Elohim. But let's write to them and tell them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things that are strangled, and from blood. These are all things that are found. This is summarized in Leviticus, I believe, 17 through 21 something like that, 17 through 21, 17 through 22. Take a look, but then these, these, are the, these are four main principles that are found in Leviticus 17 through 22. No idolatry, no sexual immorality, eat the right foods, not the wrong foods, and abstain from blood. He says, for Moshe has had through many generations those who preach him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. So what he's saying here is, you know, if they start with these four things, then they can come into the synagogues and hear the Torah of Moses read, and the Spirit's going to do the rest. Okay, so what we see here is the four requirements of Acts 15. Okay, once more, no idolatry, no sexual immorality, and that includes wrongful divorce. No wrongful divorce. You have to keep your vows before Yahweh Elohim. No strangled or unclean meats, check Leviticus 11, and no blood. Don't be drinking blood. He says, then we can assemble with the nation. And we can read and study scripture together. That's basically what's being said. And the, the, the purpose, now these are not four places that we have to just start with these four and then we can camp out. You know, we, th th these are not an ending point. These are called four prerequisite rules. And the purpose of these four prerequisite rules is to create a safe place for our children to grow up. We're creating a, a space that's undefiled by the world. It's a space that's set apart from the world. So, and basically take a look at what's saying. Control your thoughts, control your parts, and control your mouth. So if you control everything you think or whatever is laid on your heart, which is also where idolatry happens or takes place, if you'll control your genital region, and if you'll control what comes in and out of your mouth, then it's safe to let you assemble with the nation. And we can fellowship and we can study scripture together and we'll let the set apart spirit be the one to lead us into all truth. Okay, again, it's not a stopping place. But if people who are genuinely filled with his spirit, and that's a key play, a key thing, and we have to understand people who are genuinely filled with his spirit, motivated to do all of the Torah of Moshe, we'll begin with these four things and be honest and remain and don't quench the spirit which is my understanding of the of the unforgivable sin is quenching the spirit but they start with these four things and don't quench the spirit then the spirit will do the rest in context it implies joining the nation of israel it's caveat number one it in context it also talks about fellowshipping with others solomon says that he who isolates himself he rages against all wise judgment so we need to fellowship with others. We need to join in fellowship. Caveat number three, the leadership has to obey and teach these four prerequisite rules. And that's really a problem for us today because right now, today, 2012, the majority of our teachers and leaders are teaching the wrong thing with regards to marriage and divorce. So I think it's a simple majority, but we've got more teachers than not are teaching the wrong thing. So that's the reason for this teaching. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5 says, if anyone competes in athletic, you know, if we're going to run a race, don't we want to run the race that Yahweh sets before us to run and not a race of our own devising, not a race of our own imagining? And, and don't we need to obey Yahweh's rules? It says, if anyone competes in athletics, he's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. So it means there's no cheating. It means we have to have teamwork. We have to have transparency. We have to have accountability one to another. We have to keep apostolic accountability in the fivefold ministry. So again, today, a majority of our ministers 
they either teach the wrong thing about marriage and divorce, they've done the wrong thing, they're, they're, well, not done, but they are doing the wrong thing with regards to marriage and divorce, or they are associating with other ministers who have put their wives away unlawfully. Now, we all need Yahweh's mercy and His grace, but this is not okay. This is evil. In fact, we're commanded to put the evil out of the midst. Not only is that a Torah command, you've got sin in the camp. You've got to get sin out of the camp. How many times in Torah there's sin in the camp? So Israel would go up against Ai, and Israel was defeated and beaten because there was sin in the camp. It's just so important. Now, how'd you like to have a pastor like this one? He says, I know you put your wife away unlawfully, but I'll still associate with you. After all, we want to be in true unity, right? Besides, associating in true unity like that's good for book sales, isn't it? I'd just like to have that for a pastor. He says, hey, you know, I just divorced the wife of my youth, even though Yahweh said not to, and now I have a new wife, but I only have one piece of paper at a time, so it's okay, right? Okay. Put the sin outside the camp. Put sin outside the camp. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 20. If someone says, I love Elohim, but he hates his brother or his wife, he's a liar. For he who doesn't love his brother or his wife, whom he has seen, how can he love Elohim, whom he has not seen? You made a vow with Yahweh to love, honor, and cherish the wife of your youth. You're looking right at her until you die. You break that vow. Do you love Yahweh? You, you love Yahweh so much you broke your vow to him. You love Yahweh so much it's not important to you to keep your vows to Yahweh. Is that what you're saying? Okay. The, uh, we all need Yahweh's mercy and grace and forgiveness. And if you're in a situation where you were a believer, you divorced your wife, uh, she has not remarried, and you have married another believer, you have a difficult spot, you have a difficult situation, I apologize to you, I don't mean to ridicule or make fun, it's, but it's a tremendously painful situation. Or if you are a teacher or a leader out there and you're teaching that it's okay to put away the wife of your youth, please call me, please write me, servants at nazarenisrael.org. Let, let's get together and let's talk. Let's get some apostolic accountability. Yahweh winks at times of ignorance in times past, but now commands all men to repent. So please, if you're another one of these leaders and teachers, please let's get together. Please talk with me so we can do the right thing. The apostles in the first century, the writings are given to us an example as how we're supposed to be doing things. We can't, can't do it alone. It takes all of us doing it together. How'd you like to have this guy for a pastor or a teacher? I love my neighbor as I love myself. That's why I divorced my wife. Okay. Put the sin outside the camp. If he repents, that's a different story. But until he repents, put the sin outside the camp. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 4, this is the situation where we had the man having uh, relations with his father's wife. And so Shaul says, you got to get him out of there. So the Torah says, get him out of there, put the sin out of the camp. New covenant also. We, this is Yeshua's grace, Yeshua's favor. Still we've got judgment for sin. Still we have to put sin outside the camp. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 4, Shaul is saying, in the name of our master, Yeshua Messiah, when you're gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our master, Yeshua Messiah, Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Master Yeshua. So this is Shaul. This is the man who writes about favor and grace and compassion and lack of judgment. Still, we have to put the evil out of the midst. Verse 6, he says, Your glorying is not good. Okay, you're, 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 you're glorying in the fact you're not judging a man who's 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 breaking Acts 15. The apostles got together and they ruled. They said, no idolatry, no sexual immorality. You're in violation. You're, and, you're, and, you're, and you're reveling about it. You're saying, oh, we're just not going to judge him for anything that he does wrong. 
You know, we're, we're, after all, we're, you know, we don't want anyone to judge us, and so we're not going to judge anyone else. We're just going to turn a blind eye to sin and hope someone turns a blind eye to our sin. So it's kind of a, kind of a pact with the devil kind of a thing going on. We're going to turn a blind eye to his sin, and he's going to turn a blind eye to our sins. Okay, very good. Not so good. He says, your glorying is not good. It's not good. Not good. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? You let this guy in. You let this guy do something wrong. Then someone else is going to do something wrong. Then you go to punish him and you say, you can't punish him. We didn't punish this guy. You didn't punish him. You didn't punish him. Now, where's your standards? Your standards have just gone down the tubes. It's a Petri dish environment. For those of you who remember Petri dishes from high school biology, you let a little bit of mold in there, takes over your Petri dish. You've just lost your friendly culture. You can't do that. It's got to remain pure. Do you not know that a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Messiah, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. So every year at the Passover, what we're saying is sin needs to be outside the camp. No sin in the camp for Passover. By Passover time, sin cannot be in the camp. The point is, we're all called to be like Yeshua. We're called to be like Yahweh. And Yahweh gives us Hosea's example of how we're supposed to take care of our brides. So let's do like they did. And let's love our brides more than our lives. Especially for us leaders and teachers, let's give the flock a perfect example of laying down our life, picking up our stake or our cross, whatever you want to call it, and loving our wives as we love ourselves. In Yeshua's name. Amen.